First, thank you both for coming and having this conversation on Real Vision Crypto. Anthony, of course, you've been on Real Vision uh, multiple times and you've hosted Rao on your Pomp podcast. Mike, you host Mike Green in conversation series right here on Real Vision. This debate started on Twitter. We all love Twitter. It's a great place to blast out little squibs, but not always the best place to have a long form conversation. You know, when I think about this, uh, this is more than a debate between two individuals. This is two worldviews colliding, and that broader collision is just beginning to be felt around the world. I couldn't think of two better people to represent those worldviews here than you, Pomp. You're at the very vanguard of the digital assets investment movement at Morgan Creek Digital. Mike, what you do over at Logica Capital is some of the most sophisticated analysis of traditional capital markets anywhere, and we're very glad to have both of you here on Real Vision for this conversation today. Mike, since you started to make the case that kicked off this debate, why don't you go first and explain the basic framework? What is your view of Bitcoin and why? Well, just first as background, right? The reason that I became more actively involved in the Bitcoin uh, debate was kicked off by actually a Real Vision event, a blacklist event in Dallas, Texas in October of 2020. Uh, I was fortunate to be there uh, and have the opportunity to engage with a number of family offices that were almost uniformly making the observation that they were in the process of replacing gold in their portfolios or reallocating away from gold into Bitcoin. And interestingly, they all use the same terminology, that it was the superior asset. As I began to evaluate that condition and to think about that dynamic, uh, it was important for me to really dig in in a professional sense. And as I've indicated elsewhere, I've participated in Bitcoin. I've had involvement with Bitcoin on a personal basis historically. I ultimately have chosen not to do that anymore. Um, and that was a personal choice. As I dug into it on a professional basis, it required a much deeper dive. Once I began to dig into it and to evaluate this claim that Bitcoin was a superior asset, it became very clear to me that that was really totally untrue, that it was an inferior asset relative to gold, certainly in terms of the dynamics of why a central bank would choose to hold it. And secondly, it, became an, it was recognizable as an inferior asset once you actually began to evaluate the claims that are made within the community. I think one of the things that sets my work apart in traditional asset markets is the recognition that a rising price does not tell you something is working, that something is going to be successful, right? You and I have been recorded where I've used the terminology driving uphill with no brakes. I would suggest the same thing applies to Bitcoin where the price has clearly risen and that gives people comfort in the story. But the reality is that Bitcoin is a superior asset for one reason and one reason only. It facilitates those who want to work against the existing system, either to generate dollars in the case of China, Russia, Iran, or other bad actors on the global stage that are trying to avoid sanctions or for criminal purposes. And as I dug further into the data that is presented within the industry, it became very clear that the data that is being presented is disingenuous. So for example, the industry will simultaneously say 95% of the data is fake, 95% of the transactions are fake, and then use those same 95% of the transactions in disputing the claim that crypto is primarily used for crime. If you look at reports like the report from Elliptical that came out in 2020, in 2020 regarding the utilization of crypto for crime purposes, they suggest that it's around 2%. And the disingenuous claim is made over and over again that the US dollar is more widely used for crime or the euro is more widely used for crime. Of course, that's true given the relative acceptance of them, but as a proportion of transactions within Bitcoin, we either have to decide that the 95% of the transactions that are referred to as being fake and therefore shouldn't be considered should be ignored when we're thinking about the dynamics of the utilization for crime purposes. And if we adjust for that, what we discover is nearly 40% of crypto transactions are actually used for crime. The vast majority of the mining activity is occurring in regions like China, Russia, and Iran. And if we incorporate the participation of mining pools, they control in excess of 90% of the hash rate. This is not a decentralized system. It has become an increasingly centralized system focused on one thing and one thing only, attracting US dollars and providing that to those who are utilizing resources in regions like China, Russia, and Iran 
to capture dollars. Pomp, I imagine you have a different view. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I uh, we can get into all the specifics of kind of Mike's opening statements. What I would just say is, uh, you know, I think that Mike's worldview, um, I'm not sure what changed, I'm sure we'll get into it, but uh, is misinformed. Uh, I believe that his uh, position on the asset and on um, kind of the growth and uh, the market adoption uh, is misinformed. Uh, and I think that um, the argument that he is making, uh, as I'll show kind of historical context, uh, is absurd. And uh, what we are actually talking about is if Mike's worldview ends up prevailing, uh, we essentially are going to cut the United States off from the future global growth. And I think that it is not only uh, a misinformed worldview, uh, but frankly, it's a very dangerous worldview. Um, and I'm actually glad that uh, most of the politicians who uh, talk about this topic uh, don't see the world the way that he sees the world, uh, because I think that, um, again, it's very dangerous and uh, it could be the single greatest um, you know, kind of inhibitant to uh, the United States continuing to have the position of power and leadership that it has on a global stage. And if Mike's worldview was to uh, prevail, he would actually be handing victory uh, to many of America's adversaries. And so, uh, you know, excited to get into it. Um, I, I really respect Mike and, and kind of a lot of his views and prior work that he's done. But I just think in this one sector of financial markets, uh, he's misinformed and, and uh, his worldview is inaccurate. Pom, you know, I, I want to characterize what I heard from Mike is there are principally two arguments that he made uh, against Bitcoin uh, that were really core to the thesis. The others are sort of supporting those two pieces. The first uh, is that Bitcoin is a conduit for criminality uh, and that the uh, rate at which Bitcoin is used to facilitate uh, criminal transactions is far higher than US dollars or euro, effectively higher than fiat. And the second is that uh, Bitcoin is inherently dangerous in Mike's view uh, because it has the potential uh, to, from a geostrategic perspective, meaning uh, that there are countries in the world who do not wish the United States well, uh, that are either strategic rivals or strategic adversaries, and they are using Bitcoin fundamentally uh, to build an advantage against the US dollar system, against sanctions regimes, and some of the other things that the United States uh, has controlled since the end of the Cold War. What are your views specifically on those points? Yeah, so let's first just start with what Bitcoin is, right? Bitcoin is simply a open, decentralized digital protocol, uh, very similar to what the internet is. And so the perspective that Mike has of as other countries leverage this open, digital, decentralized protocol for their gain, we therefore should, as the United States, uh, ban ownership, uh, prevent usage, et cetera. If that worldview was to prevail uh, when the internet came around, we would essentially be living in prehistoric times. We would be North Korea, because that is what North Korea has done to their citizens. Is they have said, you are not allowed to use this open, digital, decentralized protocol called the internet. Instead, the United States, thankfully, was innovative. It was forward thinking, uh, and it believed in capitalism and democracy. And it said, if any country is going to benefit from a open, digital, decentralized protocol, we are going to make sure that we are the leader. We are going to use this to further our leadership position on a global scale. And so while Mike, I think, has this belief that other countries are benefiting from an open, digital, decentralized protocol, uh, he's not wrong. But the reaction or the end result of that should not be, we therefore are going to opt out, because that will not stop these other countries from using that open, digital, decentralized protocol. You cannot shut this down. And so instead, what we should do is we should embrace it and we should ensure that the United States stays the leader on a global scale. And so what we've seen in other countries is when their leadership has decided to ban the participation in that open digital decentralized protocol, adoption has actually gone up among the citizens. And I think that it's a very, very misleading argument to make around criminal activity to say that 40% of transactions are for criminal activity, right? The beauty of this is while we can sit and we can guess what are the US dollar transactions, right? The difference is Mike cannot tell us how many dollars are in circulation. Mike cannot tell us and prove to us how much gold is in circulation. But I can prove to you on the blockchain exactly how many Bitcoin there are. I can prove to you and show you exactly how many Bitcoin are in circulation. 
And I can prove to you and show you every single transaction that has occurred since January 3rd, 2009. Mike cannot do that for gold and he cannot do that for dollars. And so the whole argument of 95% of transactions are illegitimate or um, fake, he's talking about the exchange traded volume. What he is not talking about is the actual transactions on the blockchain because you can prove it. And that is the divergence of our worldviews, right? Many of the issues, I believe, in the legacy financial world and the macro system, Mike and I probably actually agree on. And I actually think we agree on uh, many of the uh, solutions from the sense of uh, he holds gold um, and I hold Bitcoin. Those two things are very similar. They're both sound money principled assets. Uh, he chooses the analog version uh, or the analog application of those sound money principles. I choose the digital application of those sound money principles. And so I think that what we end up seeing here and the kind of great equalizer in this conversation is that the world that is outside of this new digital decentralized world is a narrative-based world. Mike will throw a lot of data at the wall. Mike will tell a lot of stories, but he cannot prove the transactions. How much money is laundered in the legacy system? There's estimates that over $2 trillion is laundered. The global money supply would put that at a higher percentage than what is estimated to be the illicit transactions in the Bitcoin system. The difference is I can prove I can show every single transaction. He can't do that for dollars. And so the narrative-based world is going to be disrupted and is actively being disrupted by this digital world where provability and auditability is at the core of it. And if you cannot prove something, then the narrative doesn't resonate anymore. And I think that's the key difference. And so the, the, there's not more criminal activity. And I, I just don't see a world where advocating for... Um, essentially sanctioning and cutting off. When we sanction another country, when we sanction Venezuela, Iran, uh, North Korea, we cut them off from the global financial system. And what Mike is advocating for is to cut off American citizens from an open digital decentralized protocol that the rest of the world is going to adopt with or without the United States participating. That makes no sense to me. Uh, Mike, first, is it a fair characterization that you want to ban Bitcoin uh, or think it should be banned or think we should consider banning it uh, and second, uh, Pomps uh, made an interesting argument here, which is that in effect, there's a kind of transparency bias uh, because you can see all of the activity on Bitcoin. It's much easier to detect the nefarious activities, uh, whereas in the fiat world uh, for dollar, for euro, it's more difficult to see uh, those activities. What are your thoughts? Well, I'd respond to a couple of those components. First, in terms of the transparency of everything being on blockchain, right? Pomp and others will highlight the dynamic of level two applications that remove transactions away from the blockchain. And increasingly, we're seeing this within the criminal community. What they're actually doing is disguising their transactions, right? So they're making sure that they wash the Bitcoin, the same thing that they would do if they were engaged in dollar transactions or Euro transactions. It ultimately doesn't matter. Um, he refers to the idea that $2 trillion is used for nefarious activities or illicit activities in dollar terms. Of course, that needs to be considered against the velocity of the monetary base as compared to the total stock. The velocity of the U.S. dollar is far higher than that of Bitcoin, for example, particularly if we ignore the dynamics of you know, the exchange traded transactions, which are being included in the low estimates of criminal activity for Bitcoin. The second point that I guess I would, would spend some time on is this idea that is referred to that it is an open digital protocol similar to the internet. The internet, first of all, was actually created by the US government, right? So the willingness and the desire to share that for the purposes of both national security reasons and for the freedom of information associated with it is radically different than what we're referring to in Bitcoin. Right. In Bitcoin, we're actually talking about disintermediating governments from the ability to finance themselves. Right. And I understand that that feels very attractive 40 years into the Reagan revolution and the idea that ultimately the private sector is dominant in all forms versus the public sector. But that's simply not true. And we know that's not true. Right. The reason we have nation states is and why we created them was to protect the citizens, not necessarily from themselves but importantly from those who would coordinate and work in a consolidated and centralized fashion against them, right? Nation states emerge to protect their population. And in this situation where we have 
entities like China, Russia, and Iran playing the dominant role in the processing of transactions. And it is not even a question as to whether it is the extremely dominant role. Again, 90% plus of all the hash rate exists in those three countries. And that's particularly true. Physically, it's about 80%. If we include the components of mining pools, it's in excess of 90%. When we consider that dynamic, it's completely absurd that the US government would put itself into a situation in which the control of a monetary system was outsourced in the same manner that we've chosen to outsource our iPhone production. They're just radically different components. I would also highlight the fact that while Pomp is familiar with this space, he's far from a technologist, right? And the actual dynamics of the security of the network have changed radically. The industry has become very complacent after the experiences in 2015 and 2017 in terms of who is the dominant, who is dominant, whether it's the nodes or whether it's the miners. The problem with the Bitcoin system is, is that it ultimately relies upon economic incentives to keep things flowing. The current estimate of how much it would cost to shut down the Bitcoin network, in other words, the foregone Bitcoin that would be received from controlling the mining operations. If, for example, China were to decide simply to start mining empty blocks and continually solving the, ellipti the elliptical math, uh, cryptographic problems associated with Bitcoin and releasing empty blocks into the system, continually presenting them to the nodes who would refuse them, but are unable to prevent the processing from going forward. The total cost of that is around $7 billion a year. For a nation state, that's nothing. This is an incredibly vulnerable network. The fact that they haven't moved against it yet tells you that you should be extremely suspicious that there is something else at work. I'm going to let you jump in, uh, but if you could, in your answer, uh, Mike made some pretty technical uh, assertions about the way that uh, hash power works, the way that nodes work, some of the division of labor in the Bitcoin network. If you could, in your uh, in your response, give our viewers who may not be familiar with that infrastructure a little bit of an overview on some of the points that Mike made, just so they can understand the argument at the level you guys are having it. Yeah. So the first thing I'll say is um, the point of this debate is. I would like to have a debate where we use plain English and explain things to people like a third grader. That shows that you understand it and there's no intellectual sleight of hand. Mike, when he is backed into a corner in a debate, likes to use the intellectual sleight of hand. He likes to lash out. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to simply stick to the facts and kind of explain uh, exactly why he's wrong. And so we can start with uh, his assertion that uh, I'm not a technologist. Um, Mike manages money for a living. I spent multiple years building technology companies and running product and growth teams at Facebook, which uh, as far as I understand is a technology company. And so if there's one person here who has a better technical understanding of how the system works and how the technology sector works, uh, I would say it's me. But if he wants to disagree with that, that's fine. Uh, the second thing is that um, Mike makes the assertion that Bitcoin, for some reason, was created to take down the US dollar or the United States. Mike has no clue and cannot prove to us who created it. How does Mike know that an American didn't create it? How does Mike know that a politician didn't create it? How does Mike know that the U.S. government didn't create it? He doesn't know. He's making wild assertions that are heavily misinformed, and he is making those assumptions to fit a narrative that makes no sense. And so, again, we can then go to, uh, if we look at the Internet, Mike would claim that 90 plus percent of users that use the internet are outside the United States. Therefore, the United States is allowing those people to work against the United States and we should shut the internet off. That's absurd. Just because there are transactions that are processed geographically somewhere else, that does not mean that those governments control that. Just because there is any sort of capital flow elsewhere does not mean that those governments control it. If you were to ask Mike, well, if all of a sudden your claim that Russia, Iran, and China control 90% of hash power, is he making the claim that Bitcoin is controlled by those three countries? And when they want, they will take over the network and they will do whatever they want? No, of course he's not making that claim. And if he is, it's very, very ridiculous. And so what ends up happening is we have seen by every measure, this is the strongest 
computing network in the world. There's more hash rate on this network than any other computer network in the world by a lot. On top of that, what we see is that there's a continued diversification, both in hash rate and in ownership of the actual asset. And that continues to trend in the right direction. So the United States has made a very, very big move to continue to increase its hash rate. This is a global free market competition. If Mike had his way, he would have us shut off all the American miners. He would have us a, a ban ownership for Bitcoin, because that's what he's advocating for, whether he's going to say it or not. As he said it in the past. He wants to ban ownership of Bitcoin. And so if he has that, he is going to allow the rest of the world to go use a digital, open, decentralized protocol. And the United States is going to sit this one out. That, that, that's his argument, is that we should sit this one out. And what I'm, an argument that I'm making is not only is that absurd, but the market, meaning everyone from individuals in the United States, financial institutions in the United States, corporations in the United States, and government officials in the United States are all telling us that they're going to do the exact opposite, that they're going to embrace this and that they're going to go compete in a global free market. And that is what we should do. We should embrace this and we should go use it to our advantage, not sit here and say, oh, you know what? There's, a, there's another country that has any sort of money power. When Mike says Iran, he throws that in there because he, it, it's a scary thing. Iran, Iran, Iran. How much are the hash rates in Iran? It's like less than 4%. So let's not get all crazy and start to say that uh, Iran all of a sudden owns the Bitcoin network or any of these other assertions that he's making, right? What we are seeing is we are seeing a globally decentralized digital open protocol. If the United States sits this out, we will suffer. Or we can embrace it and we can be the leader and we can further our position of leadership on the global stage. And then the entire idea of uh, China, there is a global rate for lowest cost power. And so in some way, the Bitcoin miners are driving R&D for renewable energy, and they are racing around the world trying to find it. But just because a miner sits in China does not mean that the Chinese government owns it. That does not mean the Chinese government controls it. In fact, what it means is that if the Chinese government is going to do anything to fairs, they're going to shut down the miners. And what we will see is we will see that hash rate shift. And actually, America would gain ownership of their portion of the hash rate. And so it's just a system where um, I think Mike is advocating for something very, very dangerous. Mike would like the United States to sit out on one of the most disruptive technologies that the world has seen. And I just think that's wrong. Let's let Mike uh, jump in. And for, first, Mike, if you could, I'm curious to hear your view of, of whether or not uh, you agree with that characterization. Are you advocating that we should ban Bitcoin or are you just skeptical uh, of some of the exuberance uh, on price? And second, uh, as I understood Pomp's argument, basically, Bitcoin, in his view, uh, is an open system. It's a free global competition. Uh, and just because hash power is in a particular place, it doesn't mean it's controlled by that nation state. What are your thoughts? The, the first response I would make is uh, to highlight that the idea that I am lashing out in some way, shape or form against Anthony is not what's happening. I'm making a statement of facts and we have not yet heard refutation of any of the facts or data that I have brought to the table. The second component was there were statements that were made that I am asserting that Bitcoin was created to take down the United States. Um, or that I am not claiming that China, Russia, and Iran can take it over, or that I am advocating for a ban on ownership in the United States. Um, none of those things are true, right? What I'm actually saying is I have no idea who created Bitcoin. What we know is the narrative of how Bitcoin was created is just that it was a thought experiment and a working thought experiment that was distributed by an unknown individual to a uh, you know, mailing list and it seems to have done remarkably well at continuing to propagate itself. Now, how much of that was facilitated? How much of that was supported by foreign actors? We may never know the answer to that. But the simple reality is, is that what we do know is that those foreign actors now dominate the hash rate. The second component is, is that Pomp makes an assumption. He says, if China is going to do anything, they will shut down the mining. I don't see why they would do that at all. And in fact, if we look at Iran or Russia or China, what they are all actively doing is introducing state subsidized and state licensed mining activities. And they are shutting down, i.e. taking the equipment and repurposing it 
for the private sector. So they are increasingly in control of this. This is no different when we see a crackdown in Iran of uh, unlicensed private miners. It is no different than a Xi corruption purge in which it is consolidating control. Um, in terms of a ban of ownership, I'm not advocating for that. I'm actually suggesting that I think that is the eventual outcome. Whether that is good or bad will ultimately be decided uh, by the future. But I would suggest that what Anthony is referring to when he says that politicians are saying the opposite is heavily disputed by the headlines that we've seen. Janet Yellen called it out in the past couple of days. Lagarde has called it out, right? We have any number of leaders. Gensler, who is widely cited as an individual who has taught courses at MIT on cryptocurrency, if you listen to his courses, if you actually attend his courses, he'll highlight the high frequency of criminal activity and the sketchiness of the exchanges, which are radically different in their structure than say the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, where you are facing other counterparties. When you're trading on a Bitfinex or a Binance exchange, you're trading against the house, right? You are not trading against other counterparties. It is a different system, much more akin to the bucket shops of the United States in the 19th century that were banned. Right, so to expect that this is not going to be heavily regulated and changed is, in my opinion, foolish. And I would suggest that, the, um, that what POMP is encouraging is for people to ignore those risks and effectively uh, speculate on the idea that, as he says, it is a foregone conclusion that Bitcoin is going to become the central reserve currency for the world. That's, that's just outright speculation that is designed to encourage people to invest a disproportionate share of their financial assets, whether that's taking their 401ks and piling it into Bitcoin as he's encouraging people to do, right? or whether that is encouraging people to uh, engage in um, projecting historical results forward, which we are explicitly banned from doing in this industry. From my perspective, the issue is not whether you should or should not buy Bitcoin. My issue is you should be informed. And I think the industry is increasingly structured around concealing the risks that exist for investors. I mean, we can start with, Mike said that there are politicians and then he named treasury secretaries and appointed positions. Those are not politicians. Uh, the politicians that have talked about this, Warren Davidson, the congressman, uh, Tom Emmer literally just posted the Bitcoin white paper on his website. Uh, Cynthia Lummis, who is the first senator to own Bitcoin. Uh, these people all own it. They talk about it. On the Congress floor, they literally said Bitcoin cannot be stopped and we should not try. Right? It's a paraphrased quote, but literally that was said in a congressional hearing. And so the assertion that politicians in the United States and then to name uh, the Treasury Secretary. What Mike did not say is what the Treasury Secretary said was in the clarifying statements, we should embrace this and there are a lot of good things that can come from it. So to label Janet Yellen as being against Bitcoin would be inaccurate. And not only is Christine Lagarde and others, they want to control their own cryptocurrency. They would like to create their own. And so th this is a game of... Um, Every single data point in the market, whether it is the number of transactions, the market participants, the computing power, the exchange traded volume, the number of institutions, the number of corporations, the number of retail investors, every single one of those data points suggests that adoption is increasing, not decreasing. And again, what Mike has alluded to in the past, whether it was his conversation with Nick Carter or otherwise, is that if you are participating in this system, you are working against the United States. Gone even as far as to say that it could be something similar to terroristic type activity. And my argument is that if you make the argument that if you go outside the system, if you leave the US dollar, that is a terroristic activity. Mike's entire career is to get out of the dollar, is to go into other assets, is to get outside of the US dollar. And the reason that Mike does not hold 100% of his wealth in dollars is because that would be a death sentence to wealth. If you sat in 100% dollars, that would be a death sentence. But of course we don't do that. We get into other assets. And so this asset 
happens to have a structure and a monetary policy that makes it the best preserver of purchasing power in the world. Over the last decade, there has been nothing that has done a better job than Bitcoin. Now, I agree with Mike that we cannot say because of the performance over the last 10 years, here's what the performance over the future will be. But what we can say is when you have an asset that has a cap supply, we know with 100% verifiability that there is a cap supply. If demand increases, unless Mike is suggesting that we are going to violate the laws of supply and demand, the US dollar price will continue to increase. And so what I'm making the argument for is that, of course, there are risks. There are risks with holding dollars. There's a risk with holding stocks. There's a risk with holding bonds. Nobody is saying that there's no risk. But what we are saying is that the characterization of an open decentralized digital protocol that the United States should sit out with its innovation, that the US should basically say, you know what, we're not going to participate here, would be the equivalent of the United States years ago saying, we know that the internet is being created and we are not going to participate. Our citizens will not be allowed to do it. And we would be no different than every other dictator or nefarious actor. And so the point is, this is going to happen because you cannot stop it, right? There's a lot of things that we talk about in terms of Mike has issues with, but at the end of the day, what do you want to do about it? And the simple answer is we can't do anything. You can't shut it down. You can't stop it. And so before, because of that fact, what you are going to get is you are going to get people around the world are going to adopt this thing. And the US has a choice. We can either say, we're going to opt out. We're not going to participate or we can embrace it. And every single market point is suggesting that we are going to adopt it. And what Mike is really advocating against, which to me is absurd, is that Fidelity, Stanley Druckenmiller, Paul Tudor Jones, all the way down the list, right? Renaissance, all of these guys, whether they are trading it, they are holding it, they are investing in it, et cetera. He's basically saying that they're not only one wrong, which would mean that Mike is smarter than the market, but two is he's advocating that they're doing something to work against the United States and to make an argument that the people who participate in this industry are not patriotic is absurd. And what it does is it becomes close to a level of being dangerous because what it does is it suggests that people who are looking to further the position of leadership the United States has are in some way working against the United States. And when you start to share that narrative, what you do is you create divisiveness and you start to create an environment where we discredit or disincentivize innovation and progress. And that couldn't be, there could be nothing more dangerous than that in a world that is moving to a fully decentralized digital economy. Everything is going to be digital. Everything is going to be on these open protocols. And we need to be the leader, not the lagger. Let's give Mike a chance to respond. Yeah, I mean, look, I am in no way asserting that I'm smarter than Stan Druckenmiller or Paul Tudor Jones or um, certainly Jim Simons at Renaissance or anyone else, right? I am suggesting that the fact that they choose to trade something or allocate capital towards it does not mean that they are embracing the view of Bitcoin becoming a large scale digital currency and would highlight that all of those investors and myself included have made mistakes in the past and will continue to make mistakes in the future. The question is, do we position ourselves so that we can recover from them, right? So I, I see no reason to take an absolutist position on this, nor am I suggesting that by doing so, they are intentionally behaving in an unpatriotic manner. What I'm suggesting is, is that they should consider the potential for that. And Anthony continually refers to the idea that this is a decentralized protocol similar to the internet. And that if the US were to pursue this path, it would be the equivalent of us shutting the US off from the internet. And yet the facts are very straightforward that those countries which dominate the hash rate actually have shut their citizens off from the internet. They are the dictatorships that Anthony is referring to. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. Why would they be interested in promoting Bitcoin, but being uninterested in providing their citizens with free access to the information over the internet? Pop, just so 
this conversation isn't entirely in the negative frame of reference. I'm curious, you've, you've talked about some of the advantages uh, that you believe Bitcoin uh, can bring to the United States, some competitive advantages, uh, development uh, of new technologies. Could you talk a little bit about what your view uh, of the world might look like with a decentralized asset like Bitcoin uh, playing a greater role and how it would be beneficial in your view to the United States? Yeah, so I think that there's one one key piece um, before I get to that, which is uh, this open decentralized digital protocol is quite popular on a global basis, right? It is available in many countries where US-based systems such as PayPal, Apple Pay, or Venmo are not available. And what we have seen is on a global basis, there are more transactions done from an annualized volume standpoint on Bitcoin than in Apple Pay, Venmo, or PayPal. So this system already, while it is um, presented as a nascent system or a new system, uh, a small kind of innovative experimentation, it is something much, much bigger than that, right? There's more annual transaction volume on the actual blockchain. We're not talking about exchange trade volume on the actual blockchain than Apple Pay, Venmo, or PayPal. And so this is going to happen whether we participate or not. If we do choose to participate, what I think we are going to see is there will be a continued adoption by individuals on their personal balance sheet. We've already seen that. There's some people who decide that this is a speculative asset and they want to put 1%. And you know, I think in, in the past, Mike has advocated for basically getting to neutral. If it goes up a lot, then great, you benefit. If it goes to zero, no problem. You don't really kind of uh, feel the impact, right? I think there's a lot of people who that's how they kind of view that today. There are some people who have chosen to increase it significantly. And so they are, like myself, denominating their wealth in this asset, meaning that they don't think of it as I have $100,000 or a million dollars. They literally think of it as I have X number of Bitcoin, right? And they choose to do that. They price things in that. They want to go and buy a car. It's not, I'm going to buy a $30,000 car. I'm going to buy a car uh, that is going to cost me one Bitcoin, right? So that denomination obviously increases. You convert the dollars into Bitcoin. The second group of people are the financial institutions. And so when you think of it from a pure price performance, right, they're uh, much less of a kind of religious believer in this. They're much more of a financially driven actor. They see a uh, asset that is the best performing asset over the last decade. And therefore, they believe that there's a continued adoption, which will lead to a continued price increase, which is why they want to participate. And then when I think you look at the corporations and you see a number of the corporations who have started to allocate their balance sheet, we are talking about publicly traded companies that have taken material dollars, tens of millions, if not over a billion dollars, and converted it into Bitcoin. What they are saying is we are worried about the future macro environment. We are worried about our purchasing power. And we have decided that this is the best asset to protect our wealth. And I think that part of Mike's argument is, if you look at historically at the inflation levels, there is very little to suggest that we will have high levels of inflation in the future, and therefore, it is a mute point that people are choosing to use this as an inflation hedge. I think that the Bitcoin response to that is, one, people don't wait for the inflation to happen before they move their wealth, and two, whether they are right or not, you cannot disagree with the fact that they are saying that is why they are doing it. And so I think that's the key piece is um, a lot of people in the finance world, they, they would like to make an analysis and then prove why somebody is wrong. This is the wrong way for something to happen, right? I take the position and I say it all the time. My opinion doesn't matter and neither does Mike's. What matters is the market. And the market is emphatically saying people want this and they are adopting it. And I think that the benefit to the United States and to individuals is that the United States wealth inequality is at the worst it's ever been. And it is that bad because we have a government and a central bank where it has become normalized to have interventionism and to create an ever widening gap because the bottom 45% of Americans hold no investable assets and we are devaluing the dollar and pushing that divide further and further and eliminating the middle class. And the data is pretty strong to suggest that. What we are talking about here is returning to an environment where outside of the last 50 years, we spent thousands of years 
which was that the government was not able to create more money as they deemed fit. And I think that's ultimately the entire point of this is just because we spent the last 50 years doing this doesn't mean it's the right thing. And many people would argue, as would I, that the wealth inequality gap has gotten worse and worse and worse over the last 50 years. If you look at the stock market and you denominate it in dollars, it is up and to the right at a 45 degree angle. If you denominate that same stock market in gold, it is down since the 70s. And so when you start to look at this, what we are doing is we have been financially engineering growth with the dollar devaluation, but that is unsustainable. And so if Mike's argument is basically, we will continue to print money, we will continue to manipulate the dollar, we will continue to intervene in markets and everything will be fine forever, maybe. But the market is saying that they disagree and they are choosing to adopt Bitcoin. And the whole idea is that now there is a parachute, there's an exit, there's a way to opt out of the system. And that is people's American right and their financial uh, or, and their freedom to do what they want with their finances. And they're doing it. Well, you know, I think you may have some points of agreement uh, with Mike on some of the risks of uh, central bank intervention and the challenges of wealth inequality. Mike, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's part of the irony here, of course, right, is, is that I'm not actually disagreeing that many of the complaints that people make about the role of central banks or the intervention by central banks is something that we should ignore and something that we should not be concerned about. But the answer to that is not to opt out of the system. The answer to that is to clearly communicate alternate preferences. Right? We, there's nobody who has made more effort to explain why we see this separation between the fundamentals and stock markets than myself. Right? And understanding I agree the with you. regulators and others have played in facilitating that type of behavior right, is absolutely critical. But to decide that Bitcoin is the answer or to encourage the young people in America to believe in a narrative of a collapsing dollar and imminent inflation that is going to destroy their purchasing power, right, that's a concern for the old. The loss of purchasing power against accumulated financial assets, including dollars, is a concern for the old. For the young, the concern is how do I convert my human capital into nominal dollars? Right? How do I ensure that I make sure that I'm being adequately compensated for my labor and that that labor is actually capturing income that I'm not sitting unproductively locked in, in my house because I'm unable to go to work due to lockdowns? Right? Those are all concerns that I share. And I think that we need to change our society to reflect that. But the path of Bitcoin is a siren call that is fundamentally false. That's the point that I am continually making. Yeah, and, and I think I said earlier, right, Mike, I, I think you're kind of reiterating this, is like, Mike and I see pretty eye to eye on the problems, and I actually even think, uh, you know, directionally the solution, it's the actual application of the solution, right? And Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that you guys hold uh, kind of what I would consider dollar-denominated investable assets and gold but no Bitcoin. And I think that the argument that the Bitcoin community is making, um, you know, and just right in line with the gold community is uh, there needs to be something that changes. Now, uh, whether it is an awareness and a let's change the system from almost inside the system, or it is an opting out, I think that's where the kind of divergence of beliefs, beliefs happen. The piece that I think is really, really important to talk about is um, I fundamentally believe that we are going to see, just like we have seen with individuals, financial institutions, and now corporations, eventually central banks around the world are going to put Bitcoin in their reserves. And what we are going to see happen is that Bitcoin, just like it is the parachute for individuals, financial institutions, and corporations, it will become the parachute for those central banks as well. And so in some weird world, the thing that Mike is advocating against or, or advocating that, hey, there are risks here, which again, there are risks, of course there are risks, is going to be the same thing that is adopted by every single one of those kind of members of the establishment. And so what I think is really important to kind of understand is having no exposure to this asset, in my opinion, is the wrong answer. If you have zero exposure, that's the wrong answer. 
even if you say, I think that there is a 1% chance that we have a future world where Bitcoin is at the center of it, then you should have 1% exposure to the asset. But I find it very hard pressed, right? And, and remember, there's some very staunch critics of this that have recently capitulated. Elon Musk, Ray Dalio, Mark Cuban. I mean, just the list goes on and on and on of people who I think most folks would agree are intelligent, who are trying to get it right. They might not always get it right, but they're trying to get it right. And what they have all started to talk about is there is some future version of the world that includes this asset. We may all disagree on the severity of the success of the asset. We all may disagree on the importance of that asset for certain groups or certain organizations. But it is very, very hard to see a future version of the world where this asset does not play an important role for anyone. And it is also very, very difficult to see a world where the United States, or frankly, any superpower, decides to kind of sit this one out. And so I think that ends up back at kind of square one, which is if this is going to be important in the world, and if this is going to be an open decentralized digital protocol that is adopted by people somewhere in the world, you should probably be the one to adopt it so that you're not left behind. And I think that's kind of my message here is get off zero, get off zero exposure. If you're a family office, if you're an institutional investor or an individual, having zero exposure at this point is the wrong answer and you've got to get off zero. Mike, what's wrong with a 1% exposure in the interest of diversification and an unpredictable future? So one, I think that it would be a lost 1%, but the that is my personal uh, interpretation of the facts. You know, I find it interesting that it is almost impossible for Anthony and others involved in this space to not make the appeal to authority, right? Mark Cuban is doing it. Elon Musk is doing it, right? I'm encouraging people to think for yourselves, right? And ask yourself, really, is there a 1% chance that the U.S. government is going to choose to give up its access and its control of the monetary system to embrace Bitcoin as a reserve asset Given that, as I described, and Pomp was unable to refute, $7 billion per year could turn this system into a you know, smoldering heap of garbage. Right? It's not hard to do. The fact that they haven't done it yet should be warning you that they have something else planned. Right? This is not difficult. And nobody has been able to come back and say, well, here's the reason why that can't happen. Right? This is a system that is designed to appeal to people's economic interests. War is not an economic interest. We are looking at a situation where all I'm asking people to do is to thoughtfully evaluate. Have you addressed the questions of how this network is secure in the face of a concerted effort from a non-economic actor? Two, when you think about the arguments behind Bitcoin, and I, again, it was interesting that institutions are allocating to the best performing asset. That is unsurprising to me in the same way that many companies bought worthless dot-com businesses in the 99 to 2000 cycle, that many decided to reorient their businesses around it, much to their chagrin later. It's unsurprising to me that individuals like Michael Saylor, right, who are a product of that time period, have chosen to take their investors' money and pile it into a speculative asset in the hope that they again become relevant. Right? These are not individuals that I would turn to for guidance. And so all I'm asking people to do is approach this with your eyes open. And when Anthony says 1%, what he's actually saying is, if you just want to be safe, go 1%. But if you really want to make some money, let's, you know what, let's put 20 or 30 in there. Right? We got the Glen Gary leads and they're for closers. So uh, it's hysterical that Mike thinks that he knows what I'm saying when I don't think I've said 20 or 30 uh, percent. The second part that is hysterical to me is Mike is essentially advocating that he has a non-zero percent belief that we're going to go back to a gold standard. Because if his argument is uh, a one percent allocation means that you believe there's a one percent chance that the U.S. dollar goes to zero, then why does he hold gold? Is that a non-zero percent belief that we're going to go back to the gold standard and gold is the answer? No, and I don't think that he's saying that. But if you apply the same logic that Mike uses to Bitcoin, to his own portfolio, it would look obnoxiously absurd. And so 
I think that what we are seeing here is a world where Mike does not believe in Bitcoin. That is fine. Mike does not believe in the future prospects of the asset in face of overwhelming data that suggests everybody else who is participating believes and is continuing to increase in adoption. Mike is correct in that the price doesn't necessarily mean success. But what it does mean is all of the underlying fundamentals around the amount of hash power, the number of transactions, the number of wallets, the number of individuals, the number of corporations, the number of financial institutions, in light of all of that market data, Mike is not thinking for himself. Mike is actually just running along with the narrative that he constructed last year and continues to double and triple down on in light of the market data. And so maybe there is something that we are all missing. And Mike knows. But what I am saying is, I don't try to be smarter than the market. I look at what the market is doing. And what I am seeing, whether it is a private citizen, a public corporation, a politician, or even central bankers, treasury secretaries around the world, they are all leaning into this. They are all more inclined to adopt it than not. And when Mike chooses to pick out one person over others, What he doesn't say is, if you believe that Michael Saylor is not the best allocator of capital, that's your prerogative, right? I happen to think he's done a pretty good job. And so far, his shareholders seem to be pretty happy. But Mike doesn't say that he doesn't trust Jack Dorsey, who also did the same thing. Jack Dorsey took 1% of his assets at Square, and he decided to go ahead and allocate it to Bitcoin. And so this isn't a story about one person. It's not the story about one company. It's not the story about even one country. This is a global open, digital, decentralized protocol. And what we are seeing across the board is continued adoption, even in countries where the countries have banned ownership of that asset, banned the transactions of that asset. We are continuing to see adoption. To exactly that point, one of the specific points uh, that I heard Mike make, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, uh, is the risk of a non-state actor potentially attacking the network with hash power, when you think about it as a technologist, uh, do you see that as a significant risk to the potential stability of the network and the value of the underlying Bitcoin tokens? Before you respond, Ash, I just want to clarify, it's not a non-state, it's a non-economic actor, right? So a state actor would be a good example of a non-economic actor. Yeah. Yeah. And Mike, I'll summarize your point just to make sure that kind of we're all talking about the same thing here. Your argument essentially is uh, there is an actor who, for non-economic reasons, could determine that Bitcoin is bad and therefore uh, would take actions that have no economic benefit to them, but have some sort of non-economic benefit, whether that's for power, control, censorship, et cetera. Fair categorization of, uh, of the argument? Yes. So I think that there's a couple of different things, right? One is the analysis that Mike provides in terms of um, what somebody could do uh, is the $7 billion he's talking about. This is not a static world, right? As you bring more and more hash power on the network, the beauty of Bitcoin is that people see you bringing more and more power on the network. So people always say, you know, one of the kind of first elementary questions that people will ask is, well, why doesn't every central bank just print a bunch of money, then take it, buy you know, a bunch of mining equipment, and then go ahead and, and just get 51% control of the hash rate, right? And then they can do whatever they want. They control the network. Well, there's a couple of things. One, you got to actually be able to purchase that much. And right now, if you wanted to buy $7 billion worth of hardware, you couldn't do it, right? So, so there's a, a manufacturing kind of um, you know, backstop, if you will, because American companies are buying up all of the mining equipment, right? The second thing is, even if you were able to get a lot, not 51%, but you could get a lot of hash rate, and you would then try to clog up the network, there's a number of things that other miners could do, the other economic actors could do. Everything from uh, you know, essentially increasing the amount, you could literally, as he suggested, reject a lot of the blocks or the transactions, you could also um, essentially, uh, you could basically try to cut off, right? Whether it's through a fork or something like there's all kinds of different things that can happen. And it's not just a static thing where everyone stands still, right? It, it, it's kind of the same argument that I hear a lot about like quantum computing, where people say, well, if a quantum computer is developed, then people will attack it. Well, sure. But over time, as the nefarious actors improve their technology, improve their tactics, 
so do those playing defense as well, right? And so as we get better uh, or the, the kind of nefarious actors get better skills or tactics or technology to attack the network, the network is actually improving as well to play defense. And what we have seen by every measure is that this is the strongest computing network in the world. And there is a very, very strong argument that suggests that regardless of whether it is the kind of um, very nuanced technical attack that Mike is talking about, or it would simply be a kind of an elementary 51% attack, is that the economic incentive is too great to do it, right? If you were to hack the Bitcoin network, the point of hacking the network means that Bitcoin would not be valuable. And so you'd be stealing something that has no value, right? Because the second that you hack it, it kind of uh, uh, ruins the entire thing. And so I think that in Mike's standpoint, or Mike's argument, the important part is non-economic actor. But again, the non-economic actor is non-economic, meaning that it is not in the best interest of that person to do that thing. And so this argument that somehow uh, one country is going to take this action and another is not uh, just makes no sense. There's more to gain from embracing it than from fighting it or destroying it. And so if you look around the world, regardless of the story, whether it is North Korea, Iran, Turkey, China, Russia, somewhere in South America, uh, the United States, or anywhere else, every single one of those countries stands to gain more from it than they stand to gain if they go against it. And that is why we are seeing all of them start to figure out ways to participate, whether it is to allow private corporations where they can tax them and regulate them, whether it is to actually allow for the transactions, right? Uh, there's governments now accepting Bitcoin in certain parts of the country or, or uh, of the world and in the United States. Uh, there's also been a number of times where we've actually seen countries say, we are going to participate ourselves. We are going to use national resources to subsidize, or we are going to use them to um, actually acquire Bitcoin for ourselves. And so in every single one of those situations, countries are choosing to embrace it, not fight it. And again, I understand what Mike's argument is, but the logic that he is using flies in the face of every market data point that we have today. And I choose to believe that things in motion stay in motion, that there is not going to be some external boogeyman that is going to come and going to reverse 12 years of progress and momentum because we are scared of some unknown non-economic actor who is going to choose to attack this thing rather than benefit from it just like everybody else. Mike, does that... Uh argument in any way allay your fears of a non-economic actor attacking the system? No, to argue that a non-economic actor has economic incentives is, you know, in my opinion, uh, an attempt to end run the question, right? We're talking very small sums and the impact in terms of uh, a collapse in Bitcoin price, that that would lead if, if, And if a non-economic actor were to decide, as I've uh, indicated, that they wanted to throw significant sand into the work, start mining empty blocks and preventing transactions from occurring, we know that what would happen is that the price of Bitcoin would collapse. The economic actors would not be in a position to finance significant expenditures to increase hash power in response to that. Right, so it becomes an end game where it relies on economic principles. It relies on economic incentives. And again, it's ignoring the very simple observation that oftentimes players play with non-economic interests at their, as their primary motivation. If he could address that, he would have, he has not. And again, from my standpoint, it just speaks to the vulnerability and it goes directly to the point that there is very low probability not a high probability, a very low probability of central banks around the world choosing to embrace Bitcoin, right? They are not going to do so. On the other side of the equation, I just wanna emphasize this. I do think that we will see a move to digital currencies. There is no question that central bank digital currencies are coming. There's no question that cryptography is going to play an increasing role and digitalization is going to play an increasing role in our lives. But I do not think that Bitcoin is going to be the vehicle that we choose to do that with. Mike, what do you think the percentage chance of central banks adopting Bitcoin are, just in their reserves? Not as a global reserve currency, just at all. 1%? Infinitely small. But, but not zero? 
So not an absolutist position of it's a zero percent for chance. the Canton of Zug, or you know, for um, the the Swiss National Bank that has already decided to make Apple. Sure, they may choose to do so. Will the Fed do so? I would say significantly less than one percent probability. And further, I would suggest that your attempt to trap me in some form of Saint Petersburg paradox, where one percent of an infinitely large outcome therefore justifies participation, like that's just fundamentally false. Right? That is a misunderstanding of the role of expected utility. Well, if you think that it's not zero, that there's some non-zero chance that central banks kind of remember individuals, financial institutions, corporations, central banks do it. What would you say the chance is that over the next 10 years, uh, let's say 10 percent of the Fortune 500 companies end up putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet? Is that over under 1% chance? I think it's going to heavily depend on the future performance. And I would suggest it's much less than 10%. Much, much less. Okay. That, and, and again, there's no right answer, right? I'm just trying to understand. Well, no, I, I understand. Listen, Anthony, what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, if others adopt this, then the price will go up. Therefore, I should adopt it. And I'm suggesting that that is a fundamentally false way to reason this. Right. I, I'm the, actually the way not way to think that. about this ultimately is what is the probability of the outcome that you're describing and what is the return that exists for those who risk a sizable fraction of their net worth? Now, you may claim you're not suggesting people to put 20 or 30 percent, but you have repeatedly on Twitter and elsewhere highlighted the returns of Bitcoin as your returns. Right. You're identifying it as this is what I have done. That's just not true. And the only reason I can think of that you would do that is you're trying to get people to do exactly what you're, do you're saying you're not. No, Mike, you're misinformed. Uh, the reason why I say that is because 96% of my net worth I've chosen, not because I was early, not because I was on Silk Road or decided to uh, buy a couple of Bitcoin and now it's worth a lot. I have chosen to convert from a dollar denominated world to a Bitcoin denominated world. And therefore in dollar terms, yes, I, meaning my portfolio that I've chosen to convert almost hundred percent of has done that. But again, what I go back to is you believe that it is a financial asset from a financial return perspective. You are saying if you buy at X price, your immediate assumption is what is the price at which I will sell, right? You did that yourself. You bought Bitcoin early at a low price. You allowed it to appreciate, and then you sold it. It was a financial asset to you. What I am making the argument for is the blind spot in your argument is that as we have seen over and over and over again in history, is that there is a non-zero chance that Bitcoin becomes the global reserve currency where nation states, individuals, corporations, and financial institutions decide and choose to actually conduct transactions with this as the base currency. And in every single economy around the world, there's a native currency. In the US-based economy, there's a native currency. In the Chinese-based economy, there's a native currency. In Russia, in every single economy around the world. In the digital economy, there is not a native-based currency until today. And now what this has allowed, because the friction of the currency switching has dropped to near zero, you no longer are going to be required to live in a single currency world. I agree with you that central bank digital currencies are coming. I actually agree that there are going to be private currencies, things like Libra and many copycats of those. But what it is going to do is it's going to create a global free market where the competition is not at the technology layer. The competition is at the monetary policy layer. And I would challenge you to show me a monetary policy that is superior to Bitcoin's monetary policy for the individual, for the economic actor to protect their purchasing power. There is no currency in the world that has a better monetary policy to protect your purchasing power. And the reason that you hold gold is because you believe that it will purchase, it will protect your purchasing power, right? Actually, you that's not true. That so, so the reason why we hold gold is because it has orthogonal behavior to the US dollar because this is a commodity, right? It's simply a commodity. So it's no different than corn. It's no different than wheat. It's no different than steel. It just happens to be a very dense store of value in the form of a commodity. Now you're arguing something totally different. I'm not saying that gold is a currency, nor have I, nor would I ever suggest that gold was actually a currency. In fact, 
the currencies that circulated with gold as their backing, they traded at a nominal value that was in excess of their gold content. Right? The fact that they were backed by gold created ultimately a floor, but it didn't define their economic value. Right? So your uh, allusion to 5,000 years worth of history here is simply false. And as you like to say, misinformed. But when I actually look at what you're describing, you're describing a system in which you say, this is the superior asset for preserving wealth. This should be the ultimate asset for the boomers and everyone else who never want to have to worry about having a job or an economy that takes risks around them. I'm not suggesting this is a terrible store of value if it were to be heavily adopted. But what I am describe, what I am suggesting and what I will stand behind is that it is a terrible economic policy for the individuals that are choosing to buy this, for young people who want jobs, who want to actually participate in an economy. Bitcoin is a terrible product. It is setting in place the guarantee that those who currently hold that Bitcoin need do nothing economic in order to gain actually increased purchasing power relative to those who participate. And that's the core of the argument that I have made over and over and over again. Now, under those conditions, I would be willing to bet that we see Bitcoin banned. Not by me, because I don't control that dynamic. But I would suggest that those appointed regulators that you dismiss are ultimately going to pay a much play a much larger role than the politicians that you can cite from Wyoming or elsewhere who also get perfect scores from the NRA, stand against the, green, uh, the new Green New Deal that many of those who want to buy into Bitcoin think is the future, right? I would encourage people to look at the bedfellows that you have. Making the claim that gold was not a currency, uh, I don't even know how you can defend that. Currency has two things, the store of value or it's a medium of exchange. You yourself have said that it's a store of value. It's a hard store of value. Uh, and it's pretty undeniable that it was used as a medium of exchange and therefore meets the definition of a currency. When it comes to the asset of Bitcoin, again, the premise that uh, there are two worlds, right? The world we live in today is if you have dollars and you do nothing, you lose money. You're guaranteed to lose money. That's why you get out of the dollar, you get into investable assets, right? I think that's an economic act to, to conduct and that's why people do it. To then condemn a system where when you actually go ahead and you buy the asset or you convert into that asset, you will actually accrue value makes no sense to me. It's no different than what gold has done for hundreds or thousands of years. Why are there cultures around the world where they save their wealth in this hard store of value? It's the exact same thing. Now, they don't say, oh, we have gold, so we're not going to do any economic activity. Instead, what they say is, we want more gold, and therefore, we are going to go do economic activity to get more gold. And so the same thing happens in a Bitcoin-denominated system. You don't just sit there because your purchasing power is going to be protected. You instead go and conduct economic activity so that you can get more of the Bitcoin. Right? It, it, it's no different than, again, what has happened for centuries. And I think that oh, it, it, it is, is quite different because, again, what you're describing is a system in which the quantity is fixed. And so ultimately, there is no mechanism by 2140 in which there is an increase in the quantity of Bitcoin. And so any ac economic activity simply becomes a function of reorganizing the deck chairs on the on the Titanic. Right. It does not have the capacity to create additional wealth. What you're describing is a system in which very much like a game of Monopoly. The end game is to take from everybody else. That's not how an economic system works. That's the system you're promulgating, that you have not fully thought that through is not my fault. That, that is exactly how the current system works. Is you no, are that's not how the system works. No, that is not how the system works at all. There are plenty of mechanisms by which we can change the policy to encourage broader distribution of those dollars. We've done so in the past. We can increase taxes on the extremely wealthy. We can introduce a more progressive distribution system. We can encourage the separation of employment from the basic services that many Americans or others around the world require. Right, those are choices that our policymakers can make. And by distracting ourselves with some fantasy around a deflationary currency 
that locks in a distribution that, again, looked very much like a monopoly game where the objective is to take a finite share of wealth from other players, right? That's a mistake. And that's what I keep emphasizing. The only thing I'll say is uh, the claim that taxes somehow is a redistribution, the bottom 40% of Americans, 47%, whatever it is, of Americans don't pay those taxes, yet the wealth inequality continues to increase. And so those, while may, from an academic standpoint, be targeted for some sort of redistribution, uh, they, they're completely ineffective. And when you look at it from a government standpoint, the government, since I think about 2012, has continued to take in more federal income tax every single year, yet the intra-year deficit continues to increase. And so what we have is, frankly, a very ineffective monetary system that continues to enrich the wealthy and to punish the savers, right? What what you're essentially doing is you're advocating for a system where a teacher, a fireman, a police officer, a middle manager, an accountant is supposed to go to work. They're supposed to be good at their job. They're supposed to get their income. And then if they do nothing else other than their job, they will be punished. They will have the purchasing power stolen from them because of the monetary system. Instead, what we then ask those people to do is one of two things. Either consume and go and spend as much as you possibly can. So don't build wealth. Consume. Get materialism. Get more of material goods. Or two, to become a professional investor, to learn how do you take the dollars that you were paid at work and use them to get out of the dollar into investable assets. And I just fundamentally don't agree that that is the best system. And I believe that this new system is better. We're going to see kind of where we end up. But so far, the market is rendering a decisive victory on every single data point that that system, that new system is being adopted by multiple market participants. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Mike, anything to add there? Yeah. I I mean, again, I'm extremely comfortable making the statement that markets uh, often provide an indication that something is incredibly successful, even as it is failing. And I would suggest that Bitcoin is a perfect example of that. Yes, the price has risen. Yes, it has been the best performing asset. Yes, that is attracting additional institutional investors and an increasing amount of institutional dollars. That does not suggest that the system is robust in the same manner that the XIV, as it approached all time highs in prices, was not suggesting that the system of volatility selling was robust or that the dynamics around the S&P 500 and stock markets around the world had completely failed as of March 26, when we wrote a note saying, no, they're going to move to all-time highs because of the structural features of the market. Right? That does not, price does not determine success. And so to point to the best performing asset of the last 10 years would be no different than highlighting the performance of JDS Uniphase in 2000 and say, aha, this is going to be the company that is the future, which many did at that point. This is, in my opinion, no different, except it adds an additional wrinkle to it. We are willingly participating in a system that is dominated by those who have explicitly stated bad intentions towards the United States. And I would encourage people to be very thoughtful about how they choose to participate. That's it. Mike, that sounded like a summation pomp any final thoughts? What would you like to leave the audience with in terms of your view? I think the only thing that I would clarify about Mike's comments are uh, price is what he likes to kind of identify out of the argument. What he continues to kind of throw aside is uh, all of the other market data points, which is uh, the adoption the number of wallets, the transactions, the hash rate, right? Every single one of these underlying fundamental data points that suggest a healthy, robust, um, kind of well-adopted market and system continue to trend up and to the right. Um, I think that his summation of uh, advocating for the demise of the United States, again, uh, you know, to put it bluntly, it's just flat wrong. And instead, what you are hearing is you are hearing innovators, you are hearing technologists say, this system cannot be stopped. It will not be shut down. And therefore we must embrace it and we must be the leaders in the global landscape. If we are not, we will be left behind. And I think in Mike's worldview, what, whether he is outright advocating for it or he is basically leading people to believe is the outcome of the United States is going to cut ourselves off from this innovation. 
would be no different than sanctioning ourselves. Just like we cut off other cultures and other uh, populations around the world from the global financial system, this new global, digital, open, decentralized protocol, Mike believes we are going to essentially sanction ourselves from participating. And I just fundamentally disagree with that. The beauty is, though, he's a really smart guy. He's been right about a lot of things. He's been wrong about, wrong about a lot of things. So have I. And I don't think him nor I are going to be the ultimate kind of referee or judge here. I think it's ultimately going to be the market. The market's going to decide whether, to Mike's point, we've hit a all-time high and we talk in six weeks and Mike says, you're an idiot, I told you, and it went to zero. Or we talk in six years and you know, I say, Mike, I'll take you out for a drink because I feel bad because the market was right and you know, I can't say I'm right. It's just the market will decide. I think that it just is what it is. We have two different worldviews and that's okay. Like That's actually what makes the market. That's what provides opportunity. Uh, and we're going to see what happens. You know, an incredible amount of information here, really complex arguments on both sides, uh, a great deal of data, a great deal to sift through. I think I need to go uh, Google St. Petersburg paradox because I'm not sure I understand it still. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Thank you both for having this conversation on Real Vision. We appreciate it. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.